Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Jessica Foley, Chief Scientific Officer of the Focused Ultrasound Foundation. I'd like to welcome all of you to today's presentation on cancer immunotherapy. A quick note for those on the webinar. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit it via the chat function at any time during the presentation. We will collect these questions until the Q&A period begins at the end of the presentation. We will get to as many questions as we can during the time we have. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Jill O'Donnell Tormey, CEO and Director of Scientific Affairs for the Cancer Research Institute. She joined CRI in 1987 and has been Chief Executive since 1993. Prior to joining CRI, she served as a research associate in the Department of Medicine at Cornell University Medical College and as a postdoctoral fellow in the Laboratory of Cellular Physiology and Immunology at the Rockefeller University. Today, she will provide an introduction to CRI and the important recent advances in cancer immunotherapy. Jill, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Jessica, and I'm hoping you can hear me. Uh, so it's a real honor to be here and to uh, give a, basically an overview of what is happening in the field of immunotherapy right now. So uh, just I'll start by really just introducing a very brief introduction of the Cancer Research Institute. So our mission at CRI is to really save m more lives by fueling the discovery and development of powerful immunotherapies for all cancers. We have been founded back in 1953, way before the wave of enthusiasm that immunotherapy is, not, is now realizing. And for all of the past 60 plus years, we have tried to accelerate the discovery and development of immune-based therapies for cancer by supporting critical research, investing in early development of new treatments, and uniting the effort of the field's leaders worldwide. So this is just a very brief overview of all of our programs. We actually support research through the entire continuum, from the laboratory through the clinic. Our longest standing and, and one of our largest programs is our postdoctoral fellowship program, the Irvington Postdoctoral Fellowship Program. And this is where we really train the next generation of immunologists. And most of this research is in the laboratory, very basic on the immune system and its relationship to cancer. Our next program is really a translational research program which spans the space between the lab and the clinic, actually ask, asking more direct questions that hopefully by bringing these questions into the laboratory, they will inform the design of the next generation of immunotherapy clinical trials. We also have our uh, clinical trial strategy, which is called our Clinical Accelerator, which is a unique program that really brings academia and industry together to try to de-risk and ask questions about combination uh, immunotherapies. We then also have a group that's uh, called our Cancer Immunotherapy Consortium, which is a think tank of leaders from all of the major pharma companies that have uh, are now an effort in immuno-oncology. And we really bring these leaders together as a not-for-profit platform where issues in terms of late-stage development of bringing immunotherapies to patients could be addressed collectively, which each, in, uh, each organization maybe could not do on their own. And then finally, over the last few years, we actually started a more patient-facing program called the Answer to Cancer. As more immunotherapies became available to patients, we felt it was uh, really incumbent on us as uh, kind of the leader in the field of uh, cancer immunotherapy to be a trusted source of information for patients and their caregivers. So just a very quick uh, snapshot of by the numbers, uh, all of our research decisions are made by our Scientific Advisory Council, which includes 63 of the world's leading immunologists and cancer immunologists. Within that, we have 26 members of the National Academy of Sciences and three Nobel laureates. We have invested over time over almost $340 million, supporting more than 3,000 scientists and have actually conducted 60 plus clinical trials. In our last fiscal year in 2016, we awarded $25 million in grants, and we're very proud of the fact that the philanthropic dollars that we raise are really used to support our programs, and 87% of those go to programs, which is, one, which is a, a great uh, ratio in terms of, uh, of how our dollars, these very important philanthropic dollars are spent. And obviously, we've also treated more than 1,000 patients. 
So now, really focusing, that's kind of the background on CRI, really focusing on why immunotherapy, which is the new darling of oncology, and this has really been a, a sea change in how the medical community and patients have actually viewed immunotherapy. And it started back in 2013 when Science Magazine considered cancer immunotherapy the breakthrough of the year. Uh, the excitement of the field has continued. Last year, ASCO t made immunotherapies, named immunotherapies, the top advance in 2016. So now just a, a little step back uh, in terms of for those, I don't know how varied the audience is that are, that's listening to our webinar, so just a little kind of immunology 101. So the, the immune system is obviously a system that is found throughout our entire body. It impacts a number of different organs and obviously uses both the lymphatic and the circulatory system to have immune cells circulate and survey our whole body and protect us from harm and from uh, agents, uh, pathological agents that can cause disease. Uh, it's a complicated system made up of a lot of different types of cells. Uh, the immune system can be uh, broken down into the innate and the adaptive. On the innate side, these are cells that maybe some of you have heard of in terms of monocytes and macrophages and neutrophils, and this is really uh, the part of the immune system that is at the point of entry where any pathogen or a microbial agent could enter the body, and this, is, uh, this part of the innate system is not specific but jumps into actions to get rid of these, these agents and protect you from developing disease. Now, obviously, if this, a bacterial infection or a viral infection was not handled by this innate system, the second part of the immune system kicks in, which is called the adaptive, which is really, it takes longer to mount, but it's a much more specific response against whatever the invader is in our body. And the cells involved in this are B cells and also dendritic cells and also uh, T cells. And the majority of work in, in immunotherapy for cancer lately has really been focused on T cells. So then this is a very simplified diagram just to explain that there's a very big difference from the way immunotherapy works versus what we have been used to for many years in terms of radiation or chemotherapy uh, in working as a treatment for cancer. Those traditional chemotherapies and radiation is a very static attack that directly attacks cancer. Immunotherapy works very differently. It does not directly impact the cancer, but rather it works on the body's immune cells, immune system, and the immune system ca carries an on a dynamic attack tailored to, against the tumor. So the immune system does have an intrinsic ability to recognize and kill cancer. Your normal cells of your body have markers on there, which the immune system sees and says, these are safe. These are cells that should be in our body, and therefore the immune system ignores them. When a normal cell transforms into a cancer cell, it starts producing different markers, abnormal markers or antigens on, on the surface of the cancer cell, which now identify this to the immune system as foreign or dangerous. And the immune system steps in, attacks, and destroys those cancer cells. But sometimes the immune system shuts down prematurely. The cancer cell actually is a, a wily character and is also dynamic in, in and of itself and actually can tell the immune system, do not attack me. Alternatively, sometimes even though the immune system is attacking, the cancer cells divide and outpace the response. So why now do many people feel that immunotherapy is a, an answer to cancer? So first of all, it is a very powerful system. We all, I think, have heard about people getting organ transplants and having those rejected, and these are large organs that the immune system is what is rejecting this because they see this for whatever reason that th this transplant is foreign. So we know it has a very powerful ability to get rid of things and large amounts, large potentially organs from your body. It's also very adaptable. As I said, it's not static, and as a cancer changes and mutates, your immune system has been built intrinsically to change and adapt to that so that it can, can continue to get rid of new things that are potentially harmful for the body. We also know that the immune system can carry out a very durable response. We've all been uh, vaccinated against childhood diseases like as measles and mumps and chickenpox, and we all know that vaccination actually provides a very durable response so that 
if you are ever exposed to that agent after you've been vaccinated, the immune system jumps in very quickly and eliminates this so that you don't get sick. So there's a durable, long-lasting impact of an immune response. It's also a systemic full body. It's not isolated in one particular area. Your immune system surveys your entire body and so forth, and therefore is a systemic treatment. It's also very synergistic. We've learned that different immunotherapies can be combined together, or alternatively, immunotherapies can be combined with other treatments, such as chemotherapy and radiation. Again, very targeted, as I said in the beginning, the adaptive immune system is very specific and can pick out a marker on a cell to say, get rid of this foreign agent and actually focus an immune response very targeted way to get rid of what you want to get rid of. Obviously universal in that it is not an immunotherapy so far to date has not been uh, just focused on one cancer type, but has the potential to treat all cancers. So what makes cancer immunotherapy so exciting? Well, in the last five years, there have been some significant clinical responses with both things that are called checkpoint blockades and CAR T cells that have really shown some increased survival in late-stage patients in, patient, in cancer types that previously were intractable and not really readily amenable to treatment with existing uh, therapies. As I've said, these responses seem to be quite durable, which makes sense because of the innate way that the immune system works. There has been little to no drug resistance, but there still has been some. And as I said, it has been applicable to many different tumor types and stages. So it's these kind of uh, hallmarks that I'd say that make immunotherapy a really exciting and potentially uh, revolutionary therapy that could really impact all cancers. So now going into a little bit specifics, uh, before we get into one of the major uh, excitements in the area have been things called checkpoint blockades. And this requires a little bit of understanding how the immune response works. Uh, this is to show you that here a, a, a dendritic cell actually uh, signals to a T cell through, this is called the MHC and T cell receptor. So through this first signal, uh, the T cell recognizes the antigen, which is this little green dot here. So these are the markers that are identifying something in the body that the immune system has to get rid of. If there's only one signal, the T cell will just die and go dormant. So to get a mountain immune response, it requires a second signal. And this is the second signal, which is this, this B7 on the dendritic cell is recognized by a receptor on the T cell called the CD28. So when there are these two signals, this leads to T cell activation. It leads to their, uh, to end up there, they divide and multiply and actually go out and seek wherever these cells would have that, that original marker. But the immune system has a very, uh, has a lot of checks and balances because our body even though it wants to mount an immune response to get rid of foreign invaders, it also needs to be able to limit that response so that you do not develop autoimmunity. And what happens is once there are two signals, once this happens over here, automatically the T cell starts create, re, producing a marker, uh, a receptor on the cell called the CTLA-4. And this actually also binds to the same B7 and actually outcompetes CD28 for the B7, and when this linkage takes place, it tells the T cell to stop, and it actually limits the immune response. So what the excitement in these things called checkpoint blockades is that we, they, we have developed antibodies that can actually bind to CTLA-4, which is actually the break on the immune system. And if this antibody binds to the CTLA-4, CTLA-4 can no longer bind to B7, and therefore, by doing this, the immune response continues. So in simple terms, CTLA-4 takes the breaks off the immune system. The T cell antigen receptor binding, the, the, the signal there, is actually like a putting the key into the ignition of a car. But when you know that you can turn your car on, but the car does not move unless you put your foot on the accelerator, which is the second signal. And then we do have a way to stop the car, which is the break, which is the CTLA-4 binding to B7. So this is what, by, by taking an antibody that binds to CTLA-4 and inhibits its linkage to B7, you're actually taking the brakes off the immune system and allowing the accelerator, your foot on the gas pedal, to keep going. 
And this was what was a remarkable, these are now old data, I mean, back, back to 2000, you know, 10 and so, but these were, these were the data, the Kaplan-Meier curves that showed CTLA-4, the antibody against CTLA-4 called ipilimumab was actually given to patients with advanced melanoma. And these, uh, re these Kaplan-Meier curves show that the, this is obviously uh, overall survival, that the ipilimumab had increased survival and actually had a very long tail. And if you see this combined, this data down here is, is pooled survival data from almost 5,000 ipilimumab treated melanoma patients. And you saw that this overall, three year overall survival was around 21%. In this pool of patients, the, they, the survival was typically less than six months. And it was on these data that ipilimumab got approved as the first checkpoint blockade for the treating of advanced melanoma. And one thing over here, these pictures I just want to show is that, again, how, how immunotherapies work differently. This is a patient with melanoma. Uh, they, after 12 weeks of treatment, which is typically when you get chemotherapy, you start getting CAT scans and look to see if the response. And as I said, chemotherapies work directly on the cancer. So if the chemotherapy is going to work, it will usually work within those 12 weeks. What happened here, as you can see, it looks like the cancer progressed. But in fact, if it continues, the same patient was left to continue, you can see, developed a complete remission. And in fact, where it looked like the cancer was progressing at 12 weeks, when they biopsied those samples, we actually found that they, this was filled with immune cells that were actually there killing the cancer. So again, the time frame of how immunotherapies work, again, different from a chemotherapy or a radiation. So there was a second uh, checkpoint blockade called PD-1, which uh, a checkpoint inhibitor. So uh, again, this has even produced a little bit even more excitement, I'd say, than the CTLA-4 story. And this was, again, taking the brakes off the immune system. And what we see here is that T cells have on their surface something called PD-1. It's a receptor for a ligand that's called PD-L1 that's on the tumor cell. And this, again, works exactly the same way as the CTLA-4, but in this case, the tumor cell has co-opted this mechanism that the immune system uses to control itself as a check and balance. So this is a wily thing, again, about a tumor cell, that it actually produces PD-L1 and actually inhibits, the, uh, it stops the um, T cell from being able to attack it. So again, an antibody, uh, either way, either an antibody to PD-1 or to PD-L1 has been produced, and by doing that, by giving these antibodies, it stops this linkage and, again, taking the break off the immune system. And again, these are somewhat old data from uh, Suzanne Tabalian at Johns Hopkins, uh, which showed um, this was the test with nivolumab, which is an anti-PD-1 antibody, that um, in patients over here, this is a waterfall plot, and this is again in melanoma. Uh, the different colors here are different concentrations of, of, of nivolumab that was used to treat patients. This is the baseline, the size of the tumor. If, if the bars go up, it tells you that the tumor has increased. If the bars go down, the tumor is decreasing. And you can see there's a pretty wide, uh, 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 large number of, and each one of these is a different patient. Uh, you're seeing a, a major uh, response here and showing a lot of the tumors have actually uh, reduced in size. Again, same data, again, using a, a spider plot. This is time from treatment over here. Um, and the change in the lesion size starting at base, and you can see the vast majority are either staying steady or actually decreasing in size. And this data actually showed that overall survivor with, with nivolumab had a one-year survival of 62% and a two-year survival with 43%. Um, and basically, uh, in this data here, you can see 20% of patients remain progressive progression-free at two years. And again, it was based on these data that nivolumab was approved as a treatment for advanced melanoma. Oh, I can't seem to advance my slides. I seem to have locked here. Maybe someone... Nope, oh, okay. So this is just uh, another thing saying that checkpoint inhibitors can be combined for greater effect. Again, we see here this on the left side panel. This is anti-CTLA-4. This is anti-PD-1 or PD-L1. And 
CTLA4 is working at the lymph nodes. As I said, PDL1 is working at the tumor site. So it was thought that if you could combine these together at two different sites uh, in the body, that you could actually get combined effects. And in fact, that was indeed the case. This is a combination of anti PD-1 with anti-CTLA-4 and showing that uh, this was ipilimumab alone, three-year survival of 22% combined, a two-year over su overall survival of 88% with two checkpoints combined. And again, this combination was approved by the FDA for treatment in, in, in melanoma. So now I'm going to switch in terms of the, another type of immunotherapy, because immunotherapy, again, is a, is a kind of a catch-all term that covers a lot of different types of therapy. And as I said, the checkpoint blockades with those two are, are ones that have received an awful lot of excitement and approvals, but there's another one that is under develop, development, which is called CAR T-cell therapy. And these are actually engineered T-cells by taking the T-cell receptor as well as the uh, an, uh, anti antigen binding domain from an, uh, an antibody that's specific. And this is, again, in, um, in, in uh, ALL, uh, acute lymphocytic leukemia, there are markers. These are B cell leukemias uh, that have on their surface something called CD19. So you can take this antibody binding section for CD19, combine it for what is called a chimeric antigen receptor, put this on a T cell and infuse this into patients. And the CAR T cell seeks out and destroys the cancer cell. And, and these were a treatment that was used. And in fact, um, in all many trials, this is not yet an FDA approved treatment, but in the many clinical trials that have been taken place in this, they've seen that with adults with ALL, there was an 88% complete response rate. And in children uh, who had been treated with many, many different types of therapies before, including a bone marrow transfer, you were seeing about a 90% complete response rate. So this is a, a remarkable treatment for these, uh, for, for leukemias. There's a work going on to see if this same type of therapy can move beyond hematological malignancies and into solid tumors. Now another type of immunotherapy is called oncolytic viruses, and in fact, this one oncolytic virus has actually uh, been approved again in melanoma. And an oncolytic virus is a virus that actually can seek out preferentially and infect tumor cells. And once it gets into the tumor cell, it actually replicates, a, it's a virus, so the virus replicates within the tumor cell and actually kills the tumor cell so that the tumor cell bursts and when it's actually killed, it's also releasing the markers or the antigens on its surface that the immune system sees. And so those antigens can then get picked up by dendritic cells and actually then stimulate, as we've talked before, a T cell to also attack. So there's a local effect and a systemic effect. And the fact that it's a virus, it actually is, is almost a natural, it's an adjuvant to the whole treatment in that it's actually alerting the immune system because it's a foreign antigen. And uh, data has shown in melanoma that there was a durable response of like 16% uh, versus 2% in, in, in not getting the oncolytic virus, and it was on those data that uh, one of these oncolytic viruses have been approved for melanoma. And then there's another type of immunotherapy that's also received uh, uh, approval from the FDA, which are called bite therapy or bispecific T cell engager. And this is actually taking two different antibodies, pieces of them, and making an engager. And one part of the antibody binds to the T cell, one binds to the tumor cell. So it acts as a linker between the T cell and the tumor cell. And when that linkage takes place, the T cell becomes activated, releases uh, cytolytic granules that can kill the tumor cell. And this has been uh, something called Blencyto, which has been actually uh, been approved by the FDA for acute lymphocytic leukemia. So those are the types of immunotherapy that are actively either been FDA approved or uh, under further investigation. And you can see this is just showing you the remarkable uh, advance from 2010 to 2016 in terms of the various immunotherapies that have received FDA approval. And, for the, and it's not just in melanoma, but we've had non-small cell lung cancer, kidney cancer, multiple myeloma, head and neck cancer, bladder cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma. So you can see we're seeing more and more, and ongoing right now, there's, there's I think, more than 1,500 ongoing immunotherapy clinical trials testing various new types of immunotherapies, 
and already existing immunotherapies that are in combination to see if we can get this to be a treatment that can really impact all cancers. So the goal essentially of immunotherapy is to raise the tail of the curve. As you see, again, a Kaplan-Meier term, this is patient survival versus time. With no therapy, you can see patients die rapidly. Conventional therapy moves this curve over, but many people still die. We're seeing with cancer immunotherapies that there's this thing called the tail of the curve. And so patients are living and they're living longer. And the hope is by combination therapies, we can raise this tail so that more and more patient patients can have durable responses. So I think the future of immunotherapy really lies in combinations, and this is kind of a simple framework to understand the various areas of active research, because to get immunotherapies to work, and in the 20 or 30 percent of patients where we're seeing immunotherapies really working, we have to understand why it's working in those 30 percent and not working in the other 70 percent. And I think a way to think about it and a way to guide the type of research that needs to be done is that there is a, a circular process. There's a three-step process to generate cancer-specific T cells. There's the processing and present, presentation of the cancer-specific antigens. There's presence of uh, pro-immunogenic signals and adjuvants priming and activation and proliferation of effector T cells. And over here, I've just added the many different either positive or negative agents that we already know of that work at all these various steps. So once you have this pool of, of effector T cells that are primed to go after, seek out, and destroy the cancer cell, those cells do have to traffic to the tumor site and infiltrate the tumor bed if they're going to work. And then once in the tumor bed, they have to take on killing in this tumor microenvironment, which many times is a very suppressive environment to the immune system. So this is just a, a snapshot to explain how complicated this is and how many potential agents or all of these steps could have to be looked at and understood in an intelligent way of how we can combine this together to get be better immune responses in each and every individual cancer patient. So this, again, is just showing you uh, all of the various kind of areas of immunotherapy and cell types that can be done that can actually be put together. The blue are things that have been already approved. White are things that are unapproved. But you can see there's ways that we can combine lots of different things that affect both T cell immunity, B cell immunity, adaptive immunity, and the innate immunity. And this is where active research is still ongoing. So I think, as I've already alluded to, the future of immuno-oncology really lies in turning those non-responders into responders. We have the proof of principle that immunotherapies, at least in a subset of pa cancer patients, and this is not just one cancer type, of course, many different cancer types, can actually have improved overall survival with immunotherapies. But we need to understand why this isn't happening in 100% of patients. And I think there's various possibilities in the non-responders. There are three kind of classes of non-responders. One that's really called the immune desert, that really here you do not see these are, this is a, a, a slice of a, of, a, of a cancer cell, cancer uh, tumor, but you really don't see any immune cells, which are things that are, are labeled in a brown color. So this would be considered an immune desert. We're not seeing an immune response at all. And this is a defect in T cell priming. And so we need to induce inflammation in these tumors. And there's various ways of doing this, vaccines, cytokines, chemotherapy, all of these different agents. And I would say, since this is a focused ultrasound webinar, the question will arise, does focused ultrasound have potentially a role here in inducing inflammation? In other cancer patients, they are what would be called an immune excluded. We see that there are immune cells here labeled in brown, but at the border of the tumor here, you're seeing they're not infiltrating the tumor. So why are these T cells, though they're activated and there and primed to attack a cancer cell, why are they not getting into the tumor bed? And this is because there needs to be various ways of overcoming physical and cellular barriers. So this is the stroma, the extracellular matrix. There's also myeloid-derived suppressor cells here. And again, the question would be, would focus ultrasound have a role here? And then there are the inflamed tumors. Here you see there's, there's uh, activated immune cells, the brown cells, in the tumor bed, but the tumor's still not getting killed. 
and that's because there's suppression in the tumor microenvironment. And these are, uh, we have to overcome that suppression. And again, is there a role for focused ultrasound here? And so the future of immune oncology, uh, these are the kind of the trending considerations. These are very active areas of research that we see in terms of the applications we get in and seeing what's happening in the field. There's an awful lot of research going on of where the action is in the tumor microenvironment and what is happening there. We're also seeing that the microbiome, that means the, the normal bacteria floral, flora that you have in your body seems to have an influence on the immune response, and we're trying to understand what that is. Metabolism is also playing a role because various metabolism may predict T cell function and patient response to immuno-oncology. Another active area is neoantigens. These are personalized vaccine targets that we're showing that every patient's tumor may be very different and have the antigens or the markers that the immune system see may be singular to that patient. So these new antigens that arise because of the mutations in that patient are the grist for creating personalized vaccines that could, could be used in combination with checkpoints. There's many more checkpoints being uh, looked at right now beyond the CTLA-4 and the PD-1, PD-L1 axis. Uh, immune profiling, we need to understand how to select patients to predict what their response will be to a given immunotherapy. And we really need to expand our, the technologies and the toolbox. And again, I would say this is where focused ultrasound comes in. So I think the future really lies into personalized immunotherapies. And that's going to be delivered by combinations. And combinations may vary from tumor type to tumor type, but also from patient to patient. And this is where I think the entire field is going, and it's going to take a lot more research to get there, but I think this is, we're on our way. So, um, just. so then the key takeaways of this would be that the uh, immune system is uniquely equipped to adapt and systematically disrupt cancer. We can get cure-like results can be achieved with immunotherapies in deadly late-stage uh, cancers, at least in a subset of patients and we need to understand how we can do that for all patients. I think the field now has a clear framework in how to deliver higher cure rates for all types of cancer using combinations. And as I said, the future effective therapies will be immune-based and personalized for each patient. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Jill. We have gotten a few questions online and I encourage um, others if you have questions to please submit them via the chat function. So the first question is, can immunotherapy cause any sort of adverse effects? Yes, it can. Uh, there are different um, adverse effects than what would be typically uh, associated with chemotherapies and radiation. These are all immune based and uh, there's a, I would say there's a wide uh, array and range of these side effects. Some patients that we've heard of have said immunotherapy is like a walk in the park compared to chemotherapy, and they really had no side effects. Then there are others that do have, you know, controllable side effects, many of them being uh, diarrhea, uh, which is a, a side effect that Initially, uh, physicians weren't expecting and patients weren't expecting, but we've learned that patients need to speak to their doctors about this very openly, and in most cases, these are controllable side, uh, side effects with steroids that still seem to allow the immunotherapy to be effective, but seems to limit those side effects. And then there's been more serious side effects, and I think we are still learning as more and more patients are being treated outside of clinical trials as these are FDA approved now and they're becoming widely available to a much broader range of patients, we are starting to see other side effects that I think we have to learn about. And um, there is an awful lot of people concerned about this. And uh, as I said, I think there is a price to pay for, for, for uh, responses. And I think in most cases, the, pay, the doctors that have been at the forefront of this feel the majority of these side effects are controllable, but I will say some are more serious than others. Okay. Um, our next question is, why do combination therapies seem to work better than single drug therapies? Well, I think 
think, and I, as I try to show through the trauma, this is a very complicated system. I mean, cancers themselves are very complicated, and the immune response are very complicated. And we have uh, cancer cells have a lot of escape mechanisms, and therefore they, they, whenever you seem to pressure them from one spot to limit them one place, they seem to have ways to get around that and, and really escape those controls. So you realize that it, combinations come at this from various different mechanisms. So when the combinations work mechanistically differently, so you're not just giving things together that work the same way. You're giving things that work on different pathways. And so you lessen the likelihood that the cancer can escape if you're hitting them from multiple angles and in different ways. And that's why combination therapies work better than single agents. Um, we have a question about modeling of the response of immunotherapy. So has there been like mathematical modeling completed with certain immunotherapies using patient data to um, kind of predict their response? So this is a very active area of research. Uh, I think we are learning that those very valuable patient samples that come from clinical trials give us a window to ask questions that we couldn't ask before or look at mechanisms that can't be. And this is where we have to learn from this. And I think part of this is computational and bioinformatics. And it's because you're looking at not only genetic changes and immune changes, and it is this is uh, bringing a multidisciplinary teams together that can handle large data pools and also ask various questions in terms of modeling how things happen is, is very important and I think is a big part of the future and is an active area of research. Okay, uh, the next question you, you may not have a, a lot to say on, but can you explain, at least from your perspective, a bit more on how ultrasound therapy, focused ultrasound, maybe could benefit uh, immunotherapy? So again, as you're right, Jessica, this is not my area of expertise, but from what I do understand, uh, one thing it can do is obviously focus ultrasound can cause direct tumor destruction. Uh, so this, again, is a way when, when tumor cells get destroyed, they do die, but they also release the markers that the, can, the immune system can see. So it's almost like an auto-vaccination. So again, I think that's a role that can happen there. I think... Uh, the question is, you know, can, can it affect in, in one purpose? I mean, again, can it also immune stimulate? I know that, that the micro bubbles of, of thing can, can actually uh, potentially stimulate dendritic cells. Could it also, I don't know if it can also work on some of these checkpoints. And so I think this is where, uh, you know, we have to understand, like, is, you know, does, does focused ultrasound work on the innate immune response? Like, what does it do for NK cells or the myeloid cells? Can focused ultrasound induce cytokines? And cytokines are a major important player in various steps of an immune response. Um, I, you know, again, we, uh, the other thing is a physical barrier. As I said, trafficking into tumors, the whole stroma, which is the, in a tumor, the things that are not tumor, but it's like fibroblasts and connective tissue, and that can be a physical barrier to getting T cells into the tumor bed. Could focused ultrasound be used there to disrupt that stroma and that microenvironment? So that's kind of my thinking, but again, uh, not my area of expertise, and there's probably others that know better, but I think these are things, the questions we need to ask and look at. Okay, that sounded like a pretty good explanation to me. So, um, given that there are many different biomarkers um, for measuring various things within the, with the, immune, within the immune response, um, is there a, a, a test um, well, this says, is there a lab that tests for this? But I think maybe are there lab tests for these various markers um, so that a patient could actually um, be more informed on um, which specific trial they might want to consider? Yeah, so this, 
the whole question of biomarkers, obviously an active area of research. We all would love to have specific biomarkers that could be able to tell us which patients would respond to which immunotherapies and which would not. And this would obviously focus therapy for patients and be a major boon. Uh, it's a very complicated and confusing area. Uh, one of the biomarkers with the anti-PD-1 and PDL one antibodies being approved of therapy, and there are now four different antibodies that have received FDA approval on the market, one, some against PD-1, some against PDL one and each one of those antibodies seem to have their own what are called companion diagnostic tests for being able to measure the level of the PDL1 ligand in the patient's tumor sample or within their immune cells. And there is not agreement across these different antibodies of everybody uses a different level. And some of these antibodies can be used no matter what the PDL1 level is. In other cases, the FDA has approved the use of this antibody with a certain level of PDL1 expression. So it's very complicated and it's not very satisfying for patients or for scientists. And I think we need to, as a community, take uh, learn our lesson in terms of uh, of using these biomarkers because it's it is not a complete yes or no answer. Patients with PD, high, people with higher PDL1 levels seem to respond better to some of these antibodies, but it's not 100%. So low responders can respond better than sometimes a high responder. So it's, it's a really an incomplete biomarker. And I think we are not there yet in terms of being able to use biomarkers to really inform decisions about immunotherapy usage. And I think it's going to take a lot more research and it's going to have to be multifactorial. It's not just a single thing you have to measure. We're probably going to have to measure multiple things and come across kind of a, a, a wider array of understanding what's happening. And I, we're not there yet. And so, as I said, PDL1 are being tested, but again, it's really uh, a very confusing thing in terms of what it means in terms of patient response. So the trials that have occurred so far, the clinical trials, have they addressed how the immune response affects the disease recurrence um, both locally and at, at sites other than the, the local site? I think, if I, if I understand what you're asking, obviously in the clinical trials there are obviously the, the primary and secondary endpoints of clinical trials, and obviously it's usually progression-free survival or the gold standard being overall survival. And so uh, they do track patients in clinical trials. They'll see if there are recurrences and where those occurrences occur. But every clinical trial is, uh, you know, it's, they, there's not a single answer to that question because every cl clinical trial is asking a different question has different endpoints, and uh, it really comes down to what the, the goal of that trial is in terms of what ends up being collected in terms of patient samples and what the follow-up is. So you really have to look at an individual clinical trial and ask the, 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 pro, the principal investigator exactly what's happening there. impact of immunotherapy on not just the local tumor, but also the kind of metastatic tumors and, and things, and your, your thoughts on that, maybe? Well, uh, you know, again, as I, as I said, the immune system is obviously all over your body, and that's one of the advantages of trying to activate the immune response against tumor. It is a systemic treatment. So, uh, in the cases of the checkpoint blockades, when you're getting those, those are circulating all over your body, and once it activates and allows, the, you know, it allows, takes that break off the immune system and allows those T cells that are primed, those T cells are circulating all over your body, so they can attack distant sites. Uh, and even when it's in a case like the oncolytic viruses, which I talked about, those are directly injected into a one tumor site, and it kills that tumors, you know, the cells in that tumor that's being injected, but because it's a virus that kills the cells and, re and then there is this, this secondary effect that is not local, 
but it's systemic in terms of the antigens being released, being picked up by dendritic cells, activating a whole load of new T cells, which then circulate around your body and, uh, and just attack and destroy distant sites where there may be cancer cells. So again, I think the biggest advantage of the immune response is that it is not just a local effect. And in fact, we've seen things called the abscopal effect, when you just treat one tumor and the patient may have multiple tumors, you see that there's responses not just at that local tumor that was, was treated, but at distant tumor sites. And that shows you the power of the immune system to really be uh, you know, s systemic and circulating and, and surveying all over your body. Um, a question about sort of the, the characterization of the immune response. So obviously there are methods for, you know, biopsying tumors and getting your uh, feedback that way. Are there real-time um, more more real-time ways of characterizing the immune response while a patient is undergoing a treatment? So certainly, uh, they, uh, they are certainly during a clinical trial, they certainly do this. I mean, and obviously they do blood drawers and biopsies, and I think those are – I mean, as real time as you can get. I mean, I, I guess, you know, it, it doesn't probably turn around within a day, but these are types of things that are monitored. And I think we've come to learn that though you can measure T cells or B cells or you could look at myeloids, other cells in the blood of patients being treated, that may not always reflect exactly what's happening at the tumor site itself. And as I said, it is at the tumor site, the tumor microenvironment. This is where the action is. And this is where we really have to understand what's going on because if you're drawing blood, you may not see this, the immune suppression that's taking place at the tumor site. So this is why it's really important, though I know patients are probably you know, not as willing to have multiple biopsies, but it's so important in designing immunotherapy clinical trials that patients understand the value of being t able to monitor over time what is actually happening at the tumor site. Of course, we all want to see tumors disappear, and that's the ultimate goal of, of people wanting to get treated and having an effective through treatment. But as I said, we know that only 25 to 30 percent of patients treated with approved FDA-approved FDA immunotherapies right now respond that way. So there's this whole tranche of 60 to 70 percent of, of patients that we have to understand why this treatment did not work in them. The only way we'll ever learn how to do this is really to be able to interrogate what is happening at the tumor site. So in a clinical trial, if people are interested in signing up and they, pro they have to give their consent to many times go in and have multiple biopsies, but it's so important if we're going to move the field to understand what is happening there. And, this is, and these are doing very in-depth analysis of all the different cell types that are happening there so that we can really learn and understand what what needs to change in that patient so that a different combination may work in this patient, but the only way we know how to do that is to really understand the cellular interplay that's taking place in the tumor microenvironment. So what about imaging? Are there like molecular imaging um, techniques that are being developed to, to help uh, maybe limit the number of biopsies or just to get you additional information on the immune response? Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, really some cool uh, technologies. Again, not my major area of expertise, but being able to image different pool in one, in one slide that you can take as, uh, again, uh, looking to see the different cell types that are their interplay and where they are and how they move and how they change. So there's a lot of this going on. And again, I'm not really up on all of that type of technology, but it is, I think we would love to be able to find more, you know, less intrusive ways of understanding what's happening at the microenvironment. And again, a very active area of research. Could you comment on combination therapies that involve an immunotherapy and then a non-drug-based therapy like surgery or radiation? Yeah, so that's, again, there are a lot of, um, you know, I, I think surgery, you know, I'm, I, I, I view the future that, you know, surgery is 
is a mainstay of, of cancer treatment, and if surgery can take place, it's probably the best thing. Obviously, in a metastatic setting, sometimes doing surgery is, is you know, not worth doing because it doesn't really impact everything. So uh, I think surgery is going to be part of almost every treatment going forward, if possible. When it comes to radiation, there are a lot of clinical trials right now using radiation plus immunotherapy. Again, radiation falls under that category of something that leads to cell death. So again, almost like that auto-vaccination. If you can kill cells and release antigen and the immune system can take it up and recognize, you can, you can almost vaccinate against the patient, the antigens that are in that patient without knowing what those antigens are. Again, flip side of it is trying to understand what the neo or those new antigens that get developed when, when patients get cancers and then making a vaccine, a personalized vaccine that would initiate the immune response. But many would say, and I hear Jim Allison, who's kind of the, the father of the field here in terms of the what person that has, you know, discovered anti-CTLA-4, uh, say that, you know, chemotherapy and radiation are all forms of vaccination that can actually stimulate an immune response. Great. Um, in terms of some like specific treatment areas, um, obviously there's been several treatments approved for melanoma, some for prostate cancer. Um, do you see this as a therapy for treating brain tumors, or where do where is the field in, in that area? Yeah. Uh, so again, uh, immunotherapy. There's a lot of immunotherapy trials right now for uh, for neuroblastoma. And some showing some uh, some some interesting and positive results. I think we uh, you know haven't totally cracked the nut, but I think in some of the trials, even trials that the Cancer Research Institute is supporting, that uh, we're seeing stabilization of disease and in some case in case uh, patient response. So immunotherapy can work for brain cancer. I think you know there was the worry about the blood-brain barrier and T cells getting in, but it seems that uh, it is possible. And I the tests have been done either with um, checkpoint blockades by themselves in combination with like Avastin or something that it's time a, kind of a standard treatment for neuroblastoma and um, and we have seen some some responses so I think um, it's not limited you know the brain is not uh, a place that immunotherapy cannot have a role and so I think you know you're just going to be seeing over the next few years probably more and more approvals of Initially, first, probably the checkpoints, because they're for certainly ahead in terms of uh, being treated as, as monotherapies in most cases for different tumor types. But I think as the years progress, you're going to see more and more combinations, too, of, uh, of checkpoint plus checkpoint or checkpoints for, plus a targeted therapy or checkpoint plus chemotherapy. And uh, you're going to see more and more cancer types uh, being amenable to immunotherapy. Um, and Another question is about uh, kind of talking maybe about the, the side effects of, of immunotherapy. Would there be an advantage to using um, delivery vehicles to deliver the immunotherapy, like uh, being encapsulated in uh, microbubbles or liposomes or things like that to help um, reduce the, the side effects? Is that that people are looking into? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I think that the majority of side effects that have been seen with the immunotherapies is really due to systemic activation of an immune response. So I'm not sure by the delivery method is what is causing the side effects. I think the side of the adverse events are being caused by an activated immune system that is off targeting and is not only attacking the cancer, but attacking normal cells and leading to increased inflammation and, and, and you know, immune, you know, kind of inflammatory, you know, negative adverse events. So I'm not, again, there may be a role, but I'm not aware of if the delivery mechanism of the immunotherapy would, would change that. Okay. Um, and then one that's, a little bit more general on your perspective with these immunotherapy treatments going through the regulatory process, um, you know, the, why, it, why it takes so long or is it taking a long time? I mean, are they uh, being more uh, responsive now as more of these therapies are out there and is the regulatory pathway uh, decreasing time? Yeah, I 
I think the, the floodgates have opened up in terms of the regulatory pathway for immunotherapies. I mean, I think it took a long time. I mean, people had very dim views that immunotherapy could have a role in treating cancer, and we were not seeing responses. But I think success is what changes the whole thing. I think when anti-CTLA-4 is what really opened up the entire field, when you saw people with advanced melanoma that had absolutely no treatments that worked and people that were really close to, to dying, and given this one antibody, seeing these remarkable almost miraculous responses for people with metastatic disease that seem to be long-lived. Uh, that was the big hurdle to get over and that the FDA approved. And once that happened, I think the FDA is very open and amenable. And you can see that many immunotherapies have give, been given what are called you know, breakthrough, ther ther uh, breakthrough status, which it actually accelerates their, their, uh, their regulatory approval process. And I think, you know, once nivolumab, which was the anti-PD-1, got approved for lung cancer, that's really, I think, opened the entire field's view that this was not a one-trick pony. I think immunotherapy is here to stay. Here's lung cancer, a very, you know, large cancer, affects many people, never thought to be amenable to immunotherapy. The melanoma was always thought that it would be amenable to immunotherapy. Lung cancer wasn't. And when we saw the same types of these remarkable responses in late-stage cancer patients that had failed everything else, all the platinum-based treatments and such, this really changed the entire medical community. So I think the, you know, the FDA has, I think the it's been, a, I think, a rapid uh, regulatory response in the last few years. And you can see how many things got approved in the last two years alone. And so I think that um, the FDA is, is very open and, and wants to approve these therapies rapidly. Great. Um, one question indicates that um, several immunotherapy clinical trials require a low tumor burden. And are you aware of new treatments that are more promising for patients with multiple tumors? Yeah, so I guess I, um, again, I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't do treatment. I, I, I'm not aware that there is this level that, they, that, that the clinical trials required a low tumor burden. I haven't seen that as a typical uh, eligibility criteria. There may be some that require that, but I think many of these trials were given to patients that had metastatic disease and, uh, you know, a significant tumor load. So, um you know, I guess that probably varies from trial to trial, but I don't see that as a as a, one of the one of the obstacles. Let's see. Um, there's a question about specific. Well, you may not. This may be a more medical question, but it was about what are immunotherapy options for. Um, HER2 plus VE and ERPR plus VE when t patients, when targeted therapy fails? Yeah, that's probably beyond my scope. I mean, again, uh, it sounds like those, those uh, markers sound like they're in breast cancer. And uh, in most cases, the immunotherapies in breast cancer seem to be focused on patients with triple negative that do not have ERPR. Uh, you know, estrogen or progesterone receptor, and uh, there has been some positive notes in there. But again, I would recommend that um, you can come to the CRI website. We have a clinical trial finder on our website, uh, and you can actually speak to a patient navigator if you're interested in immunotherapy trials, and we'll try to match you up with ongoing trials. And so that would be what I would recommend doing. But uh, again, I, I really can't give that kind of specific medical advice. I think that's about it, but one final question that someone had, um, and I would be happy to add to this as well, is um, your thoughts on the importance of a partnership between the Cancer Research Institute and the Focused Ultrasound Foundation for moving this new field forward. Yeah, so I mean, I'd have, happy to have you uh, chime in too. But I think you know, I think focused ultrasound is a technology uh, that is proving itself to have uh, multiple 
impactful uses. And I think uh, one of them would certainly be in combination with immunotherapies. And I think uh, we're looking forward, you know, we have partnered in the past in terms of co-sponsoring workshops on this topic. And uh, I think we're, we are in conversation and looking at ways of what we can do in the future in terms of co-funding research or uh, finding where we should go or putting out a kind of a, a, a blueprint of what needs to be done to, uh, to understand the potential role of focus ultrasound in, in combining with various immunotherapies. So I think uh, we look forward to the future in partnering with you guys. And I would just add that we, we have funded or co, uh, co funded a, a project on um, melanoma brain metastases using focused ultrasound in combination with a checkpoint inhibitor. And again, hopefully we'll find some other projects in the future to, um, to, to partner on and help move this field forward together. So I'd like to thank Thank all of you for joining us. This concludes today's webinar. And thank you again to Jill O'Donnell Tormey from CRI. Um, and please stay tuned to our newsletter and website for invitations to future webinars. We'll also have information on how to access the recording of today's webinar. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much, Jessica.